are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, which is coordinated by NatureServe. Uh, we're very pleased to have on today Patrick Crisp from NatureServe, who is going to be presenting um, about a guide to tools for landscape conservation planning. Um, before we get started with the presentation, I wanted to let everyone know uh, we'll have a question and answer uh, period at the end, and we would we very much want this webinar to be interactive. So um, you can you can ask Patrick questions um, by typing them into the question interface. Uh, if it's a question, it's a clarifying question. Um, I may interrupt Patrick and ask him during the presentation or more substantive questions will hold to the question and answer session but you can you can send them in this way throughout the presentation and also if you have a working microphone and speakers uh, or sorry working microphone you can also raise your virtual hand there's a little hand icon and um, then I can unmute you and you can ask the question directly to Patrick during the question and answer period so again uh, we very much hope this will be interactive and we're very uh, um, excited you could all be here today for this webinar. And so I'll turn it over to Patrick now. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I believe John is not on. Is that correct, John Monkowski? I didn't see him. Uh, oh, so he okay. may be on the audio, but I, I can't unmute him. Okay. Um, well, uh, John was going to do some introductory remarks. He's the coordinator for the North Pacific LCC. So uh, speaking for John, uh, they loved this project. Uh, just kidding. Well, we hope they're they're happy with it. So uh, moving along, I will introduce um, the other co-coordinators um, on the project, Cap Maybury, who did a huge amount of the heavy lifting on this project, and our own Sarah Carr uh, was very instrumental in this project, um, particularly for the first half of it or so. And get this to advance. There we go. Um, so just a little bit about the project. So the goal of the project uh, really is at the bottom of it to help increase use of tools by the partners of the LCC to facilitate landscape scale planning in the face of climate change. Uh, that's a tall order. Um, I've been involved in the tool development and application uh, world for quite a long time and tool adoption is something that takes quite a while, um, although it has been increasing rapidly. So this guide really is just a first step uh, to give the partners uh, something that's pretty accessible and easily understandable so they can start to get a handle on the tools that are available. Uh, some key things I'll bring up. One is we built on a great piece of research by Tillman and Seaman that um, interviewed the LCC partners, had a wealth of information, um, and in particular, a lot of the functional needs for tools were identified in that document, and we were able to build on that. Uh, the LCC did want us to focus on tools that were already in use in the region so that there'd be a, a cadre of tool experts that other people could call upon, um, but we could supplement those with additional tools as we found necessary to fill out all of the desired tool functions. Okay, so the tools, um, let's just talk about first, what are we talking about when we say tools and what roles can they play? Um, if you've been on EBM tools webinars before, you'll understand for the most part what we tend to talk about are, as tools that are software applications. So at a high level, you know, these functional groups talk about gathering and distributing relevant data. So for example, regional data portals, conducting analyses and modeling. Um, another example would be tools for conducting vulnerability assessments, visualizing data and analysis and modeling results. Uh, so that could be filled by online decision support systems and viewers. And then integrating information into planning for these various purposes. And so, for example, planning decision support systems. So what is the importance of tools in landscape scale planning? Well, some advantages here are enabling more people to participate in the process by making a lot of these things just more e more accessible online, easier to do, 
um, using specialized tools designed with graphic user interfaces and so on. Um, and likewise, bringing sophisticated capabilities to non-technical experts. So in other words, a lot of these tools are enabling people that you know, are planners and managers, maybe not modelers or GIS experts to apply that sort of capability. Making the processes used in assessments and planning more transparent and more easily repeatable. Supporting ongoing plan implementation and adaptive management. And so the bottom line is that we feel it's infeasible really to conduct this kind of complex, multi-scale, multi-sector, uh, cross-ecosystem kind of assessment planning without the use of these specialized tools. So just quickly, the process we used in this project. First, again, we utilized that previous study on decision support needs to structure the functional needs for the tools. We surveyed the partners about the past and current, as well as planned and desired tool use, and also what specific tools they either have been using or they're interested in. We analyzed those survey results and conducted additional research on tools. We validated some of that tools research with the partners in a series of webinars. We collected feature tool information and case studies, and then as we're doing now, uh, we're releasing the final tool guide and webinars to present that guide. So I do want to show some of the tool survey results. I always think um, as a tool developer, these are interesting. I won't go all through the questions, but we are interested in uh, things about, you know, are you using tools and how successful are you being or what are some of the challenges that you found in trying to use tools. Uh, something we were excited about is we got 105 responses and just a massive amount of information. Uh, would have been great to have even more time to dig into all of that, uh, but this was a fairly rapid assessment. So some of the results, uh, first of all, the demographics of the respondents, we had very good representation across the LCC uh, region, um, as you can see there. And it was fairly proportional to the amount of each of those areas represented in the region, uh, as well as we did have uh, several people from outside the region responded. In terms of staff time available for, for tool training, um, not a surprise here, but important for LCC leaders to know. Uh, most people said between you know, less than a day and maybe up to a week. Ability to pay for that training or technical support ranged from nothing to less than $1,000 for the majority. Obtaining the data, um, interesting, you know, the, the couple of decades I've been involved in this work, this answer has not really changed. Um, the vast majority found uh, the data issue relatively to very challenging. Uh, we certainly are hoping with the LCC leaders that one of the tools we'll, we'll see um, in our list is their new conservation planning atlas, and that has a role specifically in delivering relevant data to the partners. So um, it would be interesting after that is in full operation if uh, people are still answering the same way. Getting leadership support. Uh, this one was all over the board, as you can see, but again, there you know, vast majority said there's some challenge there. Um, roughly, you know, uh, about 40% or so indicated relatively to very challenging. So that would be leadership support and actually using these tools in their work. And then we had very similar results for the following three questions. So this, um, this curve here of um, you know, more people saying a little bit challenging and then uh, again around 40% or so saying relatively to very challenging in terms of obtaining the technical expertise to run the tools, getting staff acceptance for using tools and new approaches in their work, and then getting public or stakeholder understanding and acceptance of the tool results. All right, so moving on, uh, from there we had the results of the analyses, we had the previous work by Thielman and Seaman. So we wanted to focus on spatial tools. Um, there's cr criteria I'll get to in the next slide. Just wanted to point out things we did not include were GIS, just generic GIS platforms, um, documents, 
of processes, um, people identified other people as tools, um, essentially as resources for them. Uh, they, there were a lot of identifications of data sets as tools. Um, again, we included data portals, especially those with analytical um, or at least uh, some limited pan, zoom, query kind of functionality. Um, state and local tools or portals that didn't look like they could be extended throughout the region, we did not include. And then tools that were under development or not publicly available unless we had knowledge that it was fairly imminent. Uh, we also did not generally include tools that required you to pay the developer to customize the tool before you could actually use it. Um, again, with a caveat, there were some of those that are already operational in the region that uh, for relatively small effort could possibly be extended. Um, and then in cases where we had multiple tools for, with very similar functionality, um, sometimes we did list those in the matrix, but where there were many, many of those, we selected the ones that we considered best uh, fit for the NPLCC needs. Okay, um, oops, sorry. Um, so the next slide here, um, just I won't go all through this, but this just gives you some criteria about our tool selection. So what made it into our list. There were some necessary attributes that highlighted things like they obviously fit those functional needs identified from the regional uh, study. Um, they're useful for landscape level planning, um, amenable to including climate change and so on. Um, des desirable attributes uh, focused on, you know, have these been used in the LCC um, already? Can they work across ecosystems and deal with a dynamic environment and, and some other things there? So what were our results? We ended up with 100 tools in the matrix. Uh, we weren't aiming for 100. It was wide open, but once we, we started off with a larger group and we dug into each of them and examined them against the criteria, we uh, just happened to end up with 100. We also have in the appendix 75 additional tools, portals, and web resources that didn't quite meet the criteria but looked uh, still useful for the partners to know about. Uh, from there, you know, that's always daunting to, to be presented with 100 tools. Uh, we were encouraged to try and boil that down to a subset that we could feature in the tool um, guide. And the way we approach that, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later, is um, in an integrated toolkit form. So not 11 random tools, but ones that we could um, imagine fitting many of the required functions. Um, so you get broad coverage of the functional list for the tools, and then they would have some ability to work together. And then we also presented four case studies of use of some of those featured tools within the region itself. In terms of selecting those featured tools, there were a couple ways um, we could think about it. One was looking at which tools were most cited in the survey of the partners. In other words, an indication of these were the ones um, most being used already or that ones people identified uh, they were most interested in. Um, but I'll say this was not a voting process. And so this list here is ordered roughly in the number of times they appeared in the survey results. Um, but those were, again, just based on what people already knew, keeping in mind a role for this guide is increasing the awareness of other tools. Uh, for people. So we did take that into account, but not strictly. The other side of the, the column here is the most cited tools in the matrix. It should be a little more clear when I show you the matrix, but essentially the numbers there in parentheses are how many cells of the matrix the tool appeared in. So the cross between number of functions the tool served and or number of user categories it served. So there's an ordering there. And so that also is another piece of information for us to think about the tools to include, but not strictly. So let's go ahead um, and explore the guide. I'm going to go ahead and toggle over first to the landing site. Um, Sarah, let me know if any of these aren't showing up properly. Um, and so um, this one here, and let's just close out 
something. Um, this one here is the NatureServe uh, landing site. Uh, we should be creating one of these on the ebmtools.org site um, sometime in the next uh, month or so. Um, and as well, the North Pacific LCC will have its own landing page for the guides. This just tells a little bit about it, and then you can press here to download the guide itself. Um, just a note, which we'll see at the end, uh, this is live now. Um, there's still a little bit more tinkering we're doing on the guide. It should all be completely final by the end of the week, if not sooner. And there will be uh, a notice sent out through the EBM tools uh, notices by Sarah um, of when the final official one is available. So once you download the guide, you're going to get this. And so this is the actual PDF. And so I'm just going to, going to walk through this a bit. It's uh, not gigantic. You can see it's 46 total pages. Um, it's more than we're going to spend time looking at every page right now, but we'll give you the flavor of it. So the uh, first part here really is about the guide, and there's information here that I, for the most part, captured in the slideshow. Um, so things we tended to uh, include and not include um, in here, and how we define tools and so on. Something about the North Pacific LCC, um, again, some background on the tool guide development, including things like demographics of survey respondents, uh, which we've already presented. And then, again, these necessary and desirable tool attributes we looked at. And then let's move on to the heart of the matrix here. So before I show you the actual matrix, just to give you a little bit of uh, orientation to it. So the columns of the matrix are oriented to these three user categories. General public, which includes also um, you know, decision makers, higher level um, organization, leadership. Uh, in other words, people that really don't have a lot of technical background and they're going to need very easy to use tools. Um, what we call the sweet spot here really are, are resource managers and planners in the agencies of the partners that um, probably have not been using the tools a lot, but they are the target for giving them more exposure and knowledge about tools. This is the group that we would really like to see using tools more in their analyses and planning functions versus relying, as they often do, um, mostly on the technical and scientific experts. However, we didn't want to ignore that group because they are the ones who are still running a lot of the higher end modeling tools that uh, these other two groups are not going to tend to use. And they're often producing the sort of results that end up in the tools that these other two groups are going to be using. So very important category as well. And then we have these function category definitions. These are the rows of the matrix. And so these are arranged hierarchically. So you can see under ecosystem and resource modeling, there are a large number of subcategories there. And again, we provide a just brief definition of what that function actually meant. And so there are a couple pages of these. So you can see the challenge for us. There are a very large number of functional categories for tools here. And it was a big job to uh, go and find tools that could fill out all of those different functions and then cross-tab that to the different user categories. So let's go ahead and take a look at the matrix. I know this is small type. Um, you may not be able to read the names of the tools. But again, we have our functions as the rows, the user categories, uh, general public, resource managers and planners and technical experts as the columns. And so when a tool, name of a tool, appears within that cell, it means it fulfills that function, at least in part, and it is suitable for that category. Now, another thing I'll mention is that a tool category, uh, sorry, user category, can always use a tool to the left. So the resource planners and managers will always typically find some utility in these tools under the general public category. Um, likewise, technical experts, science experts may find use in all of these tools. It doesn't work the other way, though. So resource managers and planners um, generally are not going to be capable um, or maybe interested in 
learning how to use these tools under the expert column uh, because they they are fairly difficult and require some fairly uh, specific in-depth knowledge about the uh, functions and sectors those tools are serving. So we have all of those. Um, that's the 100 tools between that page and this page. So it's a, a two-page matrix. And then that's followed by tool descriptions. And there are nine pages of these from A to Z. Um, so from AHP to Zonation, um, these are all hyperlinked. I'm not going to click these, but those will take you directly to the tool supplier or developer's website. So you can then get direct information. Uh, what we have here is just a short description. So up in the matrix, all you're getting is an acronym or a name. And here you can actually see, you know, that, okay, I, I knew that tool applied to my user group and for this function, but I really have no idea what it does. This will give you a quick idea of what it does. And then the link into the developer's website. All right, so you can scroll through all of those. And then, again, 100 tools is rather overwhelming. We wanted to boil this down to this 11 tool feature toolkit. And there were a couple of ways we characterized this. One is, um, this is a you know, five different tasks in a fairly generic planning process, ranging from just getting your data or modeling um, what you have there now through um, engagement, assessment analysis, planning, and then looking at future conditions as well. And then where we have it shaded, that tool is a fit with that particular function. And so you can see um, we have some tools that are serving you know, four to five of these functions, um, several of the tools do, and some tools that uh, have a narrow, narrower range of function, but um, are doing that in a pretty big, robust way. The other way we characterize the tools is as this interoperation or schematic diagram where we have tools that are grouped into data sources and distribution models, tools grouped into uh, modeling ecosystem processes, and then these thematic assessment and planning tools, so things like ecosystem services, aquatics, connectivity, climate vulnerability, and then a tool for integration um, uh, of across all these, what we call a core assessment planning decision support system that can be sending information into these other tools and certainly bringing the results from these other tools into this core tool um, for resource planners and managers to interact with the breadth of information. So another way we characterize the tools, we have the, the tools here as the columns, and then we're characterizing them in terms of who is the developer, uh, what's its main purpose, and then a variety of requirements in terms of data, um, OS, um, software training, um, and then the outputs, and um, whether it costs anything. So you can, again, get a snapshot. It doesn't replace what you'll find, hopefully, on the developer's own websites. And that, of course, it would be the most current information. But this is just giving you a snapshot of the tool. And so there's a couple pages um, of that for the 11 tools. And then we do have um, what we call the, the story snapshot here, where we have a little lengthier description. We have some examples of use. Um, we have what you know, we call our take, so just kind of a quick snippet of um, what our take was on the utility of this tool within that 11 tool, tool, tool kit. So there's, uh, again, the 11 of these, chat, Maxent, invest, uh, the regional aquatic tool, linkage mapper, CCVI and HCCVI for uh, climate change, um, net map for hydro work, SLAM, MC1 um, for vegetation dynamics, um, Nature Serve Vista as that core assessment uh, decision support system. So then that is followed by four case studies, all drawn from uh, those 11 tools. And these had to be case studies from within the North Pacific LCC region itself. 
So each case study includes some background about the case study itself. Um, there's this sidebar where there's you know kind of key information um, about the case study, uh, how the tool was actually used um, technically within the case study, and then some lessons learned about what worked well, what didn't work well, um, capturing some helpful hints in it. So there's again four of these. Um, the NetMap one was interesting because they, the, the uh, case study team, the project team, indicated a lot of challenges that they had um, applying the tool. So we allowed the tool developer to provide a response, which was really useful, I think, in terms of explaining the root of some of those challenges that were encountered and, again, some suggestions on um, the appropriate use of the tool, either to overcome those challenges or just understand those as a limitation um, in the tool. Okay, and then we wrap up with some final thoughts, um, you know, just in general things like, um, again, appropriate use, what we learned by working with uh, the, the folks that wrote those case studies, and as well some suggestions about efficient um, use of tools and development of tools going forward, possibly thinking about this group of partners in the LCC maybe coalescing around a toolkit. It may not be the exact toolkit we presented. Uh, that'll really be determined by their use, by the market, uh, but really coalescing around that rather than continuing to invest in developing more and more customized tools that then are very costly and difficult uh, to support maybe partnering with uh, developers of tools that have a lot of momentum and stability behind them um, and expanding the functionality, functionality uh, within those existing tools. Um, references, um, and then we have uh, our deep list of acknowledgments here. You can see uh, many, many people uh, contributed. These are not the 105 people that responded in the survey. We certainly give them a lot of thanks as well. These were people that uh, contributed to the case studies and snapshots and, and some uh, additional reviews and so on. So from there, I'm going to um, toggle us back to our presentation. So just a few concluding thoughts. Um, we think this guide has really high applicability, not only within the LCC, and we're, we'll be looking for their feedback, um, but generally throughout the 22 landscape conservation uh, cooperatives and beyond um, in their conservation design work. Um, certainly coastal regions, but an awful lot of the tools uh, were watershed tools or terrestrial tools, so uh, other non-coastal LCCs should still find uh, utility. Um, we also think this represents a leveraging opportunity uh, for other efforts. There are always um, tool efforts we're aware of in terms of inventorying tools and developing tool guides for different groups. So for particularly LCCs, um, we're aware of some that are inventorying for tools as well as funding development of new tools. So we think there might be some opportunity to leverage what we've done and consolidate that guidance in one location, um, which might be the EBM tool. Uh, infrastructure hosting tool surveys and, and links to the large EBM tools database. And I'll just um, leave it with this slide here. Um, in terms of downloading the guide, again, we will uh, get out the URL shortly this week. Um, we'll be taking some questions um, from you now, as well as you can always email with me with any questions or comments, and then just acknowledging that the North Pacific LCC funded this project, um, and just acknowledging their staff uh, for their time on project guidance and feedback, uh, the partners for participation throughout the project, and the tool developers and practitioners that contributed content on the tools and case studies. So I'll conclude there, turn it back over to Sarah to facilitate, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, and I, before we go on, I wanted to acknowledge Open Channels uh, is also a sponsor of this webinar, and so the webinar recording will also reside there as well as in the North Pacific LCC website. Um, so let's see. There, are, I, I wanted to remind everyone also there are two uh, ways to ask questions. You can raise your virtual hand and be unmuted. Um, 
and this only works if you have a working microphone or if you've entered your PIN number uh, if you're calling in. Um, and you can also type questions into the question panel of the user interface. Um, Patrick has done a, a fabulous job of explaining things so far. We don't currently have any questions, so um, go ahead and, and send any in. Um, if uh, if there's any additional questions that you have. Okay, here's one. Let's see. Uh, Patrick, did you identify any major gaps in what the tools were capable, capable of relative to user needs and wants? That is a great question. I'm just going to go back to the guide. Um, we didn't specifically document or call out um, any gaps. Let's get back up to the matrix. Um, you know, mostly because with 100 tools, we, we really had um, some tools available in virtually, you know, all of these categories. Now, you can see some. Like I said, our, our real strong target here were the resource managers and planners. And there wasn't really a tool specifically focused on marsh processes for them. Um, you know, we, we had SLAM listed. There are some other tools that could deal in different ways with marsh processes. SLAM was the most specific one. So one could read this as, as a tool gap um, or say that, well, you know, modeling marsh processes is pretty complicated. That might be something that is better to have the experts do and then get the information over into more of the, the web portal, you know, exploration type of uh, tool rather than thinking of something specifically for them. So um, I'm, I'm quite sure, you know, there will be people that will go through the guide and think, well, uh, you know, I fit, say, this category and, and I would want to do that you know, myself, and there, there isn't a tool there, so there, there's a gap. Uh, but just to point out that, you know, there are so many tools out there now, I think what we're starting to see is uh, not a lot of gaps in terms of functional capabilities, uh, but perhaps the real gaps that we've, you know, EBM Tools program has been pointing out for a long time is gaps in terms of that cross-functionality or that um, interoperability among the tools. Okay, great. Thank you, Patrick. Um, that was a great question. Um, let's see. Are there another question? Are there plans to do this in other regions or nationally? Uh, there are not plans, um, at least that we are aware of. Um, uh, again, we are we're aware of other inventories that have happened for forestry. Um, there was one a couple of years ago, a very good study of tools for conservation for land use planners, like county land use planners, um, that's available on the web. Um, in terms of the LCCs, um, I am aware of individual LCCs doing their own explorations of tools and maybe providing some lists of tools and things like that. I'm not aware of anything quite this formal, so uh, that's something that we are uh, hoping to have some discussions with the LCC network again about leveraging uh, what we've done here and really uh, expanding it um, to become more of a national guide for the LCCs. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and we had a couple of comments which I'll go ahead and read. and. Uh, there was a thanks. I often feel I am a wash in tools that I have no time to evaluate or learn to use. This is a huge service, and I would love to see this done for the Gulf Coast. Um, let's see. And okay. Um, and another question: How many of these tools could be used elsewhere in North America? Um, you know, most of them can be. Um, the what, There are some in here that are built, um, they were built specifically for this region. Um, so uh, there is the, you know, you may not be able to read it, but there's the North Pacific LCC Conservation Planning Atlas. 
Now that's built on database and, and they are building those conservation planning atlases for a, a lot of the LCCs around the country. Uh, other examples are some of the um, uh, aquatic ones. I'm sorry, I'm not coming up with the names off the top of my head, but uh, some of these were built um, by EcoAdapt on top of their Madronia platform. So that's a generic platform and then the actual online tool is a customization of that. Uh, so that tool itself couldn't automatically work in other places because it's you know calibrated with you know local data and all that sort of thing but it it would be extensible um, I would say the vast majority of the tools though are um, tools that are pretty agnostic about where they're applied and even what environment they're applied in and just you know looking at this center cell here we have from NOAA habitat priority planner is uh, basically a frag stats landscape ecological modeling type of tool um, that can be applied in any terrestrial environment anywhere in the world with the appropriate data um, as could Marathi, um as a conservation process tool as can nature service uh, a um, cumulative effects assessment planning tool so all of those really um, are just software that then you bring in whatever is your best available information Okay, great. Thank you, typical. Patrick. Yeah. yeah, and that actually answered a couple of questions. Um, and also a, a word from Ecotrust. Um, Ecotrust built the aquatics tool on our Madrona framework. It requires some inputs on our end, but the framework can be applied anywhere in the world. Yeah, sorry, my apologies. Um, I said EcoAdapt. I meant Ecotrust. And let's see, there were a couple of, uh, another compliment, great, this guide is going to be so helpful, and I haven't read it yet, but I want to commend you for excellent work on this. I look forward to reading the entire report when it's ready by the end of the week. Um, okay, and let's see, um, there were also, I just wanted to acknowledge a couple people sent in some additional tools and um, also uh, a correction to something in the guide, so that's good. Um, Additional questions. Um, could you describe some interoperability issues? Uh, in a generic sense, you know, interoperability has to deal with multiple things. One, certainly I think a lot of people's minds leap to just the technical platform issues. Um, you know, those have certainly been easing over the years gradually, and I think ramping up more recently where um, tool, you know, I'll, I'll say GIS platforms as an example, um, have just acknowledged uh, that people are mashing together a lot of different tools to build, uh, say, these online systems. And so they've opened up uh, their data models, I think, to uh, make that interoperability a lot more free and easy. Um, and, and certainly, you know, folks like our partner Zecotrust um, have, have become very experienced with that. Um, so that's the technical aspect of just getting the tools to, to talk together and being able to easily move, um, say, the output from one tool in as an input into another tool. Another angle on the interoperability is just from the planning process itself. And so having a tool fill um, one part of that process, um, and if I scroll down, you know, either looking at it in this term of, you know, I've got a tool, uh, you know, let's say information is developed in MaxSense, which is a species distribution modeling tool, and I want to get that uh, into, say, uh, linkage mapper, you know, to be able to model then linkages among the patches of a species habitat, you know, uh, there's technical aspects, but then there's a planning process that you're trying to work through, uh, which, you know, is also illustrated in this diagram here where we're moving from tools that model the distribution of things into tools maybe that are, are doing assessment or you know, ecosystem processes um, and then on to assessment planning kind of things. And so um, there's that aspect. And then uh, another, I'll just conclude with a final angle 
on interoperability is the human or organizational interoperability where you know one person is not going to learn all of these tools. Uh, a project that we have presented before in EBM tools on integrated land sea planning had a very impressive person um, at the Mission Aransas National Estuary Research Reserve, um, Kirsten Madden, who actually learned Community Viz, Vista, and NOAA's NSPEC tool all in a few months. Um, but most people aren't going to do that. Um, so what you have to do is also figure out how the organizations are interoperating. Um, so, you know, who are the experts who are running things like SLAM? Um, who are the other, you know, people that are doing that, say, distribution modeling? Uh, and then, you know, the, the different organizations that actually need to do the assessment, scenario-based assessment, for example, developing their plan alternatives, testing those, and so on. So I'll stop there with that question. Okay. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Um, another question. Was there some assessment for what scale each tool would be appropriate for? Um, not, I wouldn't say a formal assessment. Again, with, um, you know, there 100 tools appear in here along with 75 different other portals and things like that. There were also many more that we had to examine and decided not to include. So, um, you know, I'd say at a minimum, we've probably looked at, you know, somewhere 220, 250 different tools and, and web resources. So it necessarily was a rapid assessment uh, that a few of us were engaged in um, that have some fairly um, broad um, and different areas of specific knowledge that we uh, had to fairly quickly examine the tool and then make a call uh, about it. But um, in terms of the scale, mostly what we were thinking of was, again, can the tool support the sort of multi-scale work that is inherent in the landscape conservation design or landscape approach that the LCCs are trying to promote. Um, and so uh, it, it doesn't mean that every tool had to work at every scale. It just meant that it played a role in that multi-scaler um, type of landscape approach. OK. Thank you, Patrick. Um, another question that's come up, how much, uh, oh, sorry, to what extent is climate change information and tools for assessing impacts integrated into tools? Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah. Um, more or less, to what extent is climate change information integrated into the tools? Yeah, and that, that's highly variable. Again, that was something that um, we kept an eye out for. Um, it, it does not mean, again, that um, each tool had to have a specific climate change function or module, for example, but we were definitely looking for um, tools that could um, incorporate um, climate change in some way, either um, as a direct stressor or being able to incorporate, you know, future scenarios of climate change and so on. And much like with the, the scale issue, it doesn't mean that every tool had to do that, um, but uh, we were looking for tools uh, that could play a role in that. Um, for several of those functional needs. I mean, we did have some of those functional needs specifically were calling out climate change analysis um, for, um, I'd have to go back to the, the matrix, but I think for um, uh, scenarios and for um, uh, the ecosystem or hydrologic modeling keeps a thing. So we definitely were looking to match tools up to that and then just in general looked at, you know, could these tools incorporate that? And uh, again, a lot of them, it's not, you know, directly inherent, but um, it's feasible. So linkage mapper, you know, is, you know, fairly generically a connectivity modeling tool, but it has been used for modeling future connectivity, um, you know, as well, uh, you know, here, CCVI, HCCVI are specifically about climate vulnerability. Uh, but, you know, things like VISTA have been used in, you know, incorporating scenarios that are also future scenarios under climate change. Um, 
So I'll, hopefully that gives a uh, uh, general idea about how we handled climate change. Okay, uh, thank you. And let's see, uh, Catherine, are you there? Did you want to did you want to uh, ask an additional question or clarify? No, it was more just to uh, clarify the, the original question. Um, we've been developing a assessment platform and struggling with how to incorporate climate change into it more specifically and directly. Um, it's one thing, I mean, in, in terms of downscale data, how you actually characterize a, a current and future condition and then actually link that in some dynamic way to an outcome. Right, and we, we definitely were not dealing with uh, the issue of getting from uh, global uh, circulation models to downscaled models, but thinking about uh, within a region where a lab has produced uh, good, fairly well accepted downscaled climate change data, you know, how is that then used uh, in the tools themselves? Uh, so we did include some some of those portals to actually get at that data, but uh, for the most part, we were thinking about um, within landscape scale assessment and planning, um, where is that information figuring in? Um, and again, things like you know SLAM um, very directly, um, the vegetation succession modeling, connectivity modeling, and so on. Catherine, did you want to follow up on that? No, that's great. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, Catherine. And thanks, Patrick. Okay. Um, another question that came in, in um, how much does the guide cover tools important for conservation planning that are outside the biological sciences? Uh, for example, uh, cultural resources, socioeconomic um, aspects, etc. Uh, let me go up to back up to the matrix because um, we act, there actually was um, I think it's in the second page here um, yeah so we did have one functional row identified um, from the old older study on socioeconomic and value trade-offs and return on investment and so um, Again, there are several tools uh, listed there um, that deal with that specifically, um, you know, including, you know, I'll point out Community Viz is a general land use planning tool and so certainly designed around um, a variety of socioeconomic and cultural objectives. Um, as well, you know, just from our own experience with our tool, Nature Serve Vista, we have integrated um, a variety of cultural, um, you know, ecosystem services, cultural areas, you know, economic things like recreational areas and so on into that tool. Um, Invest um, also certainly, you know, deals with modeling uh, things that are more of a socioeconomic value than strictly, you know, biodiversity conservation kinds of things. So um, very much those kind of tools are in there. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. Um, let's see. Uh, there was a question about whether the presentation will be available for download. Um, do, will um, that be posted on the website as well, Patrick, or? Sure. We'll, we will go ahead and pretty much that. okay yeah okay so uh, Sean that'll be posted on on at the URL and um, that'll all be sent out by the end of this week so you should get that URL. Okay. yeah is this um, presentation recorded Sarah uh, yes and the recording will be available mm -hmm. as well yep okay and let's see a uh, big picture question. Um, any success stories where the tools led to on the ground conservation success? Do these tools make a difference among decision makers rather than scientists? Uh, yeah, that is a really big, big picture question and it's going to be pretty tool specific. So you can read about um, what was done in the four case studies. Um, essentially what we used in our criteria was that the tool 
um, either we, we know for sure or from what we could glean, it has a track record um, of being applied you know, multiple times and we tend to take that as an indication that um, the tool is being informative um, to planning. I mean, a lot of these tools are fairly upstream from, you know, a direct policy um, and therefore, you know, on the ground outcome. Um, so I'd say, you know, you really have to look at the tools individually and most of the tool developers uh, tend to put those success stories on their websites. Um, uh, but that's variable as well. You know, a lot of these tools do come out of um, small labs, academic or government labs. Um, they don't have a lot of support to be, you know, keeping up with uh, marketing type information uh, like that. But a lot of them do. So you'll, you'll have to look at it from that perspective. Okay, thanks, Patrick. And uh, are there are there any university graduate programs that help train people in these tools, both in the U.S. and, and elsewhere? Um, you know, I'm going to say probably that's a bit uncommon. Um, you know, there are some obvious ones like MarkSan, um, which wasn't one of our feature tools, only because it is so well known and in so much use already in the region. Uh, we didn't feel a need to, to highlight it to increase awareness of it, but um, obviously coming out of University of Queensland, there's a whole lab and, and a lot of graduate work built around that. Um, and there may be other examples. I'm not thinking of any off the top of my head. Um, you know, some others like our VISTA tool, we try to run some internships around that. So we generate graduate students coming out with uh, some working knowledge of it. Um, but uh, I, I do think that's fairly uncommon. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Um, and, and also, if, if anyone is interested in Mark Sand training, Pagmara, uh, which is local to the North Pacific LCC, uh, does a lot of trainings all over the world, and so uh, I highly suggest getting in touch with them. Um, and let's see. Um, were there any regions that were considered to be data poor for any of these tools? Uh, we were not asked to look at um, data availability uh, to run these tools. Um, so I think for the most part, the, as I mentioned earlier, this conservation planning atlas um, has a job of uh, making available um, as broad a set of data as possible um, that is publicly available for use in these tools. Um, another job of the LCC working with the partners is um, both, uh, you know, using LCC money that is provided by the federal government um, as well as pooling the resources um, across the partners for high priority science and data development projects. So I think um, you know, if people are looking at um, tools and deciding a tool is, you know, something they would really like to use, but there are some data gaps, that that's something they can prioritize to fill. But uh, we, we did not try to dig in um, to what all, I mean, that, that would be a massive project, frankly, to look at all of the tool requ or data requirements for 100 tools and what data is available throughout the hundreds of organizations and agencies across this really gigantic LCC. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Um, and there was one other comment that the geodesign program at Penn State uh, um, might include some of these tools and, and provide training. And so I, th I think for sporadic tools, there, there are trainings. And so also getting in touch with tool developers to see whether there might be training. Yeah, I think um, I think this slide. Uh, I apologize, in our technical issues at the start actually got skipped over. But this this is a map of the LCC. So you can see it goes from uh, Northern California to Southern Alaska. Uh, there, it's it's vast. It's also very diverse. You can see the different um, uh, Omernik eco regions represented um, through there. So. Uh, you know, it is this this partnership, one of 22 uh, different LCCs, and there there is their URL if you're interested. If you just search N NPLCC, you'll find it right away. Um, so, you know, there's the the idea about the LCC. 
Okay. Um, fantastic. So I think uh, there, there's a lot of other threads that came up in the comments people sent that will follow up individually. There were a couple, a, a tool suggested and a correction, and then some other opportunities. And so, Patrick, did you have your um, email information you could flash up there? Yeah, I'll put that back up here at the end, right there. Um, and I'll just, you know, thank people in advance. Um, you know, if we got something wrong, we can work to uh, get a quick correction in before we finalize this. Um, if you had some other suggested tools, um, I'll just we, we can pass those on to the LCC. But uh, we we're well past the point where we can actually research um, any other additional tools um, at this stage. But I'll I'll certainly hang on to those um, if the LCC network decides that we would like they would like to uh, build on what we've done here. Um, then that could help feed into a starter list. So uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, this is a great presentation, and if I may be a bit immodest, uh, since I'm one of the co-authors, uh, the, the the guide looks fantastic. Um, okay, so and thank you everyone for participating today. And if you have any questions, uh, you can contact Patrick or myself, Sarah Carr, and uh, have a great afternoon, morning, depending on where you where you are. Okay. Yes, thanks everyone for your time. And thanks to Sebastian Montes for the, the great work on the guide, our, uh, yes. one of our communications people. Yes. Okay, great. I'll see you, everyone.